What's up, everyone? Welcome to the latest episode of Ethan and Nick's Trash Boat Podcast, episode 8. I'm your host, Ethan Finkelstein, here with Nick Graves at I am Finkelstein on Twitter, at Nick's, uh, Nick's Tape 15 on Twitter. And uh, we've got quite a topic today. I, I feel like, um, I feel, I guess there's no way to say it, I feel like such a hot take jockey right now. And uh, I, I already know this is going to be divisive. <laughs> it's okay. This is this is what built our friendship to start off. Um, we did not agree first and foremost on football. <laughs> no, I still remember that conversation the first night I moved in, and I was like, you know what, this is going to blossom into something, probably into something that I'm not going to expect. And here we are, seven years later, and we're getting ready to give people some insight on. <laughs> on that night as a sports fan so did you wanna... take did you take a look at what i sent you by the way already or no not yet um i i, I, need, I need you to just be able to kind of like prepare yourself a little bit because I, i'm about to make a scorching take um okay. i didn't get it but i sent I it i sent it um to oh god i can't remember the email address but it's one that you've sent me through gmail before so uh look at it through i don't know if it was a gmail address or whatnot but it's the only one that i had met, like under the memory for the for the sent items but i see the criteria that you went on um which is probably a little bit more um neutral i guess uh. We can it, it it's presented as neutral, but I wanted to keep it a little bit more front facing. I didn't want to delve into things that don't matter, such as I have bold appearances mm -hmm. as a criteria, but I don't have bold record. I don't have bowl record either. I just have the amount of bowl wins because so many of these powers have losing records in bowl games. And so, for instance, Ohio State has a losing bowl record. Michigan has a losing bowl record. You really only look at a few teams historically that have that winning bowl record from these like powerhouses. Like you have a UFC, uh, USC, you have, um, you know, uh, I believe FSU has a winning bowl record, but a lot of these do not. No, and, so, and the only the 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 highest winning percentage in bowl games from any power five team is Penn State. Yes. And so I don't really take into account the record just because these juggernauts have seen each other in these bowl games. You know, even if it's it's not a Rinky Dink bowl, it's a New Year's Eve bowl or New Year's Day bowl, the Outback Bowl. You know, those are two power five level teams who were in the mix at one point in their conference uh, race for a conference championship appearance potential either at the time BCS or current college football playoff hopeful but two nine win ten win one nine one ten however you want to put it that were matching up against one another both still ranked in the top 25 still matters especially <laughs> for bowl considerations, whatever have you. Right. Um, and, and I was careful to consider that. The other thing is, um, with regards to certain things like conference titles, there are two people on my list. My, my list is 13 contenders for this, based off mm -hmm. of my criterion. And not all 13 made it, but it was 13 prime contenders with, with the win percentage cutoff. Uh, and just to let you know that less than half of it made it, but before I get into that... Um, I took into consideration the fact that not everybody on that contender list had been in a conference. For instance, you have Notre Dame, which has been independent basically its entire existence, with the exception of this year, which is going to play one special season in the ACC because of the current situation we're in, which is another reason why 2020 is just so weird. Yes. Um, but I also took into account the fact that Penn State, in particular, didn't play in a conference until 1993. They were independent from 1892 to 1992 and joined the Big Ten in 1993. And so yeah. when you see the fact that, or, or when you hear me talk about conference titles, the fact that Penn State only has four, there's a special note given to the fact that they were essentially um, not affiliated with a conference 
up until 27 years ago. So that does play a part in this. I, I don't think it's completely neutral in the conversation. Um, just from an appearance standpoint, we understand even even if you were to con- to give consideration to an army, to a navy, and whatever you're doing, they're independent. Um, Notre Dame's dominance stems from being able to play just about anybody at any given point in time, no matter what time of day, what conference, what weather condition, didn't matter. You get that in other conferences, too. I don't hold that against Notre Dame. Penn State, other teams have a little bit of a different consideration on my end from conference appearances and even conference championships. How I evaluate conference championships is more of a recent. So it's a recency bias. So I can't say for as long as I've been watching college football, but what I can say is essentially since the BCS era when conference championships became very important to that next level of national championship, you know, contending for that program. Right. But as a converse to that, Notre Dame started becoming a little bit more, uh, let me say, adventurous with its scheduling. They made more of an emphasis to schedule big time opponents because they had to, they had to compensate for the lack of that cherry on top, so to speak, and not having that conference title game. And so, because they're playing potentially one fewer game than the rest of these contenders and not having that extra top 25 win potentially, or maybe even a top five, top 10 win, they've got to have another one of those guys in their schedule somewhere in place of a weaker opponent. And so Notre Dame's, Notre Dame's, considering their entire schedule is quote unquote an out of conference schedule, they load up each year. And so the one thing I will give them is is marquee matchups. And to that point. I also want to throw in a parallel to that when you have your SEC where they get a lot of flack for scheduling FCS opponents consistently on their schedule. Um, But what I will say is a lot of their games of importance are between weeks three and ten. So where Notre Dame can kind of spread out the amount of, you know, difficult opponents or their strength of schedule can be spread out a little bit more across the schedule. When you're in a conference like the SEC, it's it's it's, it's shark infested waters. You know, you can go three straight weekends, home, way, home, away, home, away, playing top 15 opponents and slip up. Or in a very arbitrary case, run into an SEC team that was pictured to finish at the bottom. Somehow they hit a win streak. They catch you either slipping or they enter the top 25 and you may knock them off. But how good does it look? We only remember the team as what they were, not what they are currently. The Big Ten, a little bit more spread out. I think they kind of favor the scheduling of what a Notre Dame has, with the exception of it just being an independent team where a Friday night game as a top 15 opponent on the road really may screw how you <laughs> go through your season or in other senses, when you're talking about your Ohio state, your Penn State, your Wisconsin's those early non-conference highlighted games on ABC at 7 PM, where you're playing a big 12 opponent, where you're playing a pac 12 opponent. And this is, you know, how you're going to start your season off. So there's a lot of different ways that, you know, we can put this, but I want to get right into it. And I want to give you some clarification. Mm -hmm. You're a little bit stricter on who's within your tier one, as we discussed previously, or your blue bloods. But my, my spreadsheet is only accounting for the teams that have the most notoriety. It's not necessarily everybody being considered for that tier. And I'm going to open it up by saying this. My win percentage factor mm-hmm. is is 600. Yes. And yours is what, Ethan? 650. Now, here's the thing, Nick. No, 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 no. I, I want to, I, no, wanna... I want to, I want to paint this picture for my, for, for the fans and the listeners. No, but there, I feel like there's a misconception though, because I, no, no, I no. also didn't there make isn't a misconception. I know I didn't make I just want you guys to list. understand that there is a difficulty between 600 and 650, right? 
Mm-hmm. I also want you guys to take in consideration <laughs> that errors not only do matter, <laughs> but that there are certain errors that Ethan does not consider as a mattering case. But I understand the rigidness behind the 650 because as we look at even the 25 teams that I have on my list, approximately 13, 14 have the 650. What I'm going to debate with you is where can we give and take? Okay. Where can we give and take? There are two teams on my list right now that I am I know for a fact I'm going to – I'll be shooting myself in the foot. And can I shout those teams out right now? Go for it. UCLA is one. We've already had our argument with that. We've already had our argument with that. <laughs> Number two, and I'm sorry, it's a bit of a homer, but I got to let you go. Wisconsin – can't really can't really i can't consider them as a a, a team that we can give or take just because a lot of their relevancy didn't really come until the mid to late 80s early 90s okay i've got another one that you really really need to reconsider i'm sorry i as, as as rich as their history was at one point um you're gonna tell me that you hang on is Pittsburgh really in Tier 1 for you? Just because they haven't been no. relevant since the no, 70s. No. They're not in Tier 1. At the moment of the discussion, the, the based on errors, they were in my Tier 1. But I don't really even see them, no disrespect, as a mid-Tier 3 team. If we're going on... We're doing three tiers or four tiers. I, I don't think... I wasn't... Okay, so I didn't actually prepare in, in the sense of tiers. I changed my approach... Um, about midway through last night when I compiled this to really just cover Blue Bloods. And so, and, and, and that's what we're doing, and but so, I also want to give a place. And that's fine. I, I can go off the cuff and, and consider in this discussion who's, you know, low tier one, um, you know, tier tier two, tier three, tier four potentially. And that's fine. I don't have necessarily a hard list in front of me of those or a list at all necessarily. It'll be assumed. But It'll be assumed. It'll be assumed. The, the thing is, is that the misconception I wanted to clear up before, because I feel like there's a little bit of a misconception here, is that this list that I that I sent to you, and this list that I'm going off of right now, is not where Tier 1 gets cut off. Blue Blood, for me, is is the legendary teams. You know how we had this conversation about legendary programs. And I am equating those establish those? those. I, I need you to establish those, because we came to the consensus in five seconds... We did, but at the same time, my blue bloods and legendaries are not a perfect overlap. Uh, perfect, um, you know, they're not in unison because I have some teams on those legendary programs, so to speak, that do not qualify as current blue bloods. Okay. And but but yes, we've established that, and I can go over them real quick for everybody that's listening. Uh, we have Ohio State, Alabama, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, USC, and uh, I believe. Was that it, or was there one more that, that I'm leaving out? I think we kind of put an asterisk by Michigan just because there are three national championships that were claimed that we don't consider countable. Mm, three that we consider not countable? Was it three, or was it no, four? It, no, they, they have two since the polling era began, and they have okay. one since World War II. They, they claim 11. There's nine of them. Oh, so there's more. There's nine See? that we don't consider mm. as, as legitimate. That's that's a huge ratio. That is an extremely low ratio of actual consensus titles to claimed. It is by far the, the, the biggest discrepancy on this list. The next closest that you can go to for ratio is a, is a, is a one out of three for Tennessee, who claims six but only has two consensus. And so it it really, that to me, the fact that Michigan hasn't had that, like, staying power in terms of being a a national title winner really over the course of the last 70 years, that's a little bit of a hit. And and, and especially... I I, I get it. And especially especially what they've done, you know, since the, the, the tail end of the Lloyd Carr years up until now through the Harbaugh era, that weighs in. And and I, I before I get into where I'm going with Michigan, it's why I don't have them as part of that legendary, legendary. like solidly. In, yes, they are 
for all intents and purposes, one of the premier brands in college football. You can make an argument at times they are the brand in college football along there with, with Ohio State, Notre Dame, Alabama, any, any one of these. But as far as being a legendary program, consistency does matter. And Michigan's last 20 plus years, they're not up to the same up to the same level as the others. And even then, there's another name on that list that I would argue is also not up to the uh, up to the weight of the others on that on that as well. But we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Nick, I have a feeling you have a point that you want to make on this. So my I think a team that I, I, I don't know why I'm missing and I don't understand why I'm not, you know, necessarily considering as, and I don't know if you mentioned it, remind me, but we mentioned USC, correct? Yes. We mentioned USC. Mm-hmm. Here's here's the interesting caveat with USC that I have, and it's more of a personal preference more than it is, you know, outstanding, you know, grandeur, is that when you look at a lot of these teams, USC went through a gauntlet under John McKay. They went through a gauntlet. Like, people remember Catholics versus convicts. But people also forget that USC was just right there, too. And they took their lumps to Stanford multiple times and to Notre Dame multiple times. And they also, which is a team we excluded from a lot of very high consideration, UCLA multiple times. So for me, what I also factor in is historically in those eras, what you've done against those contemporary opponents. You look at the win percentage, 698. If there were a few more of those wins, jump and get to 700, I think we'd be okay with them. I'm just persnickety in that manner. But nonetheless, USC is a legendary blue blood, stay blood It would take, and I think you can agree with me with this, it would take 10 to 15 consecutive 7-5 and to 8-4 and records for us to really reconsider USC. Just because of not just the staying power and the brand, but think about what a good USC program does for college football. Not just for Southern California, where you have two of just about every single team, but what it does for the Pac-12, too. When Washington got to the college football playoff, there were it was 60-40. Wow. Look at, <laughs> <laughs> look at Washington, but 40%. Well, this should be USC. I mean, if you want to get technical, based off of the president that they had created for themselves over the course of a, a couple decades, at one point, Washington was one of the major powers. They do have four national championships. They have one as recently as 1991. They were, at yes. one point, a predominant power um and at one point we're definitely in that in that tier one in that high tier one um they're one of two teams that realistically as recently as as the early 90s was still considered in that not necessarily a blue blood but like in that borderline conversation georgia tech being the other one um but both those schools have fallen hard one harder than another um obviously because washington at least has been uh you know in the title picture within the last two decades but it's – to me, I, I get it. Weighted against error, it does matter. But at the same time, I also don't want to rest on the laurels of what you did, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. The fact is, is that so, it is something that – it's an evolving door for me or a revolving okay. door. So on the chopping block, I'm going to get my Excel spreadsheet together. So right now we have already factored out UCLA. Mm-hmm. We've also factored out Wisconsin. We've also factored out Pitt. The next team I want to factor out of this, and they are what I would consider low tier three just because we have to put them in a tier and we can't exclude them completely. Mm -hmm. Nebraska. And I want to explain my caveat with Nebraska. Even with your 650 win percentage, they're at 690. They also have 847 wins, five national championships. Mind you, all five of them came in the the two crazy eras that they had of the black shirt defense. Give it to them. 46 conference championship appearances. Okay. The big eight. Ah, 
wasn't too many teams. They had to they had to absorb the Southwest Conference, which had all of your Texas teams, and a very underrated but very potent Arkansas football program. A lot of the narrative changed, especially considering they shifted conferences to the Big Ten, right? Right, but it, one thing you will say about this, even though the Big Eight was a small conference, at the very top, you basically had them and Oklahoma battling every year for supremacy. Every we, we, we can't argue, we can't forget the fact that Oklahoma, you can make an argument, from the 1940s all the way through the 1980s was maybe the consistent power in college football, maybe even over Alabama at that point. Um, I would. They were one B, one B, and I have. I can contend with Alabama in that era. I mean, it's it, to me three teams really from the '40s to the '80s were the dominant powers in 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 college football in my eyes. Um, you could make an argument for four with Ohio State, but off the top of my head, I think of, I think of, and I guess Notre Dame for the '40s part of that. But like realistically, if we're talking '50s, '60s, '70s, '80s, Alabama, Oklahoma, USC. Those are the teams that come to mind. Easily, without a doubt. Those are the teams that come to mind that dominated the mid part of the 1900s, and and Oklahoma being right there. The fact is, is that Nebraska probably has a chance to play for more titles if they're not looking up at Oklahoma for so many years. The fact that Tom Osborne came in at the tail end of that and then started becoming a winning coach. I mean, they they won two before Osborne ever hit his three and four, mm-hmm. but the point being is that the 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 rise of Nebraska into a national title winner was 100% delayed by Oklahoma just being that team for so long. So, yes, small conference, but at the very top, holy crap. They took advantage. They took advantage of the situation at hand. And that's the conversation I want to have, too. Texas, being in that Southwest Conference, you had Texas Tech, Baylor, TCU, Houston in that air raid offense, they revolutionized football in the eighties. Right, but how many championships did Houston win using the air raid offense? Ask Andre Andre Ware what he'd rather have. Would he rather have at the Heisman, Heisman, or one of at least a championship? I'm just saying they revolutionized college football offense at that time. I'm just giving them credit where credit is due. SMU pre Pony Express death penalty. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that SMU team is the blueprint for what TCU was able to do now in the sense that SMU dominated the Dallas Metroplex in recruiting. By the way, when we are not get, saying that, that TCU is paying players under the table, but, but we're um, not saying that at but all. But I, I am saying that that happens in college football from time <laughs> to time, but we are not implicating TCU. I just really want to get that out there we're also not condoning it no but it's it's the blueprint and texas really took advantage of what alabama created they took advantage of -of out-of-state recruiting alabama was the first football program to recruit out of state their first out-of-state recruit gonna blow your mind a wide receiver from minnesota who would have thunk it? Not me. Not me. But that's what Texas did. Texas took, okay, we have, there's some of the best in Kansas. They may not want to stay home. They took even some of the best from northern Oklahoma. You know how hard it is to recruit football players out of the state of Oklahoma from northern Oklahoma? They would rather relegate themselves to Tulsa than to leave the state. Or play at Kansas State before leaving the state. That's how I and from a new blood, blue blood standpoint, where do we put Texas? Are they just a really good tier one program? Do we put them in blue blood, new blood? Because what are we what are we doing with Texas? I I find that their historic prevalence and their relevance is confusing. I don't know what to, I don't know where to really put them. Yeah. I uh I mean they're tied with Alabama and wins. Okay, so okay. here's the thing. I have Texas, right? 
Mm-hmm. I have them as one. Of, did you? I sent you an email with this with the spreadsheet. I really want you to be able to pull it up. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. So notice how Texas is indeed included as a contender, but I have them categorized rather as, as a historical power. And the reason why I do not have them as a true blue blood is because of everything that's happened in the last 20 years. Yes, they do have two title appearances. They do have a win in 2005, but outside of that, they haven't. It's been a lot of peak, but not a lot of sustainability. If you notice, in the last 20 years, eight top 10 finishes, great. Five top t- uh, top five finishes, okay, that's one every four years. They've won two conference titles. That's one every 10 years. That is not dominant to me. And the fact is, is that whether you like it or not, and I'm being generous when I say the last 30 years for national titles, I think that that's relevant to say, okay, you can go back 30 years. I think that's a generation for most you'd consider. Um, they have one, but where they don't meet that for me is the fact that they just, they, it's not, they're not consistently a power. I had that, I had that criterion of, of, of one title in the past 30 years or seven top five finishes since 2000. And they met that. They did. They a hundred percent met that where they fall short is the fact that they really, there's a lot of division titles, but they keep getting blocked by another team on this list that I do consider a blue blood in Oklahoma. And for many years, Nebraska, when they were still in the Big 12, was a thorn in their side. It, Texas hasn't been able to dominate their own conference enough for me to really consider them. If they had seeded, if, if Oklahoma seeded just a little bit more to Texas, then maybe this is more of a, of, of a conversation. But I do place value on what you've done in the last few decades. And Texas does fall short there. All time, yes, one of the premier powers in college football history. And, 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 and the fact is, is that I believe they still hold. I, I could be wrong, but they do they hold the edge in the in the head-to-head series against Oklahoma. I thought they did, but yeah. I could very well it's, be wrong. It's, 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 it's pretty substantial but, in the record between the two. But but my point is this, right? Within their own rivalry, it's one of the most storied rivalries. The Red River, okay, it's the Red River Showdown, but it's it, it's the Red River Shootout. Let's let's be clear here. Um, it's, it's one of the most historic rivalries in college football history, and the fact is that, yes, Oklahoma hurts Texas's case, but at the same time, how many years were there there that were open f- that Oklahoma wasn't the team? There were quite a few years that you had a window of your Texas, and the fact is that we, we keep making this joke about Texas being back. They haven't been able to put it together for, for a solid full season in a long time, and, and that's important to me. That's my issue with Texas, too. And it's... They recruit well, too. There's no excuse there. It's And I didn't even bring recruiting into this, but Texas finishes with top 10, top 15 classes every year. They don't... Since... It's not the talent. It's the it's the coaching. It's the development. It's the development and, and coaching. And that's where, again, like, you can't really... So in a statistical sense, those are covariates. Those are things that you may not be able to see, but you have to account for. And this isn't something we necessarily have to account for. Um, where my concern with the Texas is they are the, as I mentioned in the, in our, <laughs> our original text messages probably earlier this week, they are the good food. They aren't the great food. They are... Your second or third option, if your first option is either closed because you missed the time to get there, or there's an obnoxiously long line and you're just hungry to the point where you don't even want to wait. They dominate in rivalry games. Bar none, Texas is one of the most dominant programs when it comes to entering rivalry games. I don't think they have a losing record in any rivalry game. They're probably one of few programs. With like a Michigan. My issue with Texas is, again, when do you get over the hump? They were pristine in that comeback in the national championship game against USC. But that's one. And that's probably the only memorable national championship that we have of Texas. Here's the thing about Texas. If you go back to the 1970s, at the time, 100% of blue blood, uh, college football royalty. You want to stretch it and say that the 2005 championship brought them back into that conversation for blue blood? 
I I don't know if I'd give you that definitively, but the fact is they had more of an argument 15 years ago. Well, now, the year before, remember, the year before, mm -hmm. they were in the Rose Bowl. That is true. The point is, is that 15 years ago, the argument is a lot stronger for them. But after the luster wore off from that championship, Mac Brown went away after 2011, or whatever year it was. After that era faded, I don't... They haven't been even close to what they were back then. Like, the last time that Texas team looked even somewhat familiar from that 2005 team was the Colt McCoy era. And we are a decade past that now. We're almost a full decade removed from the Colt McCoy era in Texas. 2011, I believe, or 2010 was his final year. We are almost a full decade removed from that. And that and was, was the last... Similar setup. But that, Similar setup but the year was, before. But those were the days where Texas was going out and winning 10 games every year and was in the title right. conversation. Those right. days are no, since not, we're, we're I'm long not taking, past them. I'm not taking away from that, but the setup was similar. The issue is during the Vince Young era and the Colt McCoy era, you could see the differences in eras of recruiting talent. At that time, a Vince Young was one in every 10. Like you had your dual threat quarterbacks, but they weren't a Vince Young. Now, almost every single quarterback now in today's era has to be a dual threat. Colt McCoy, for all intents and purposes, was a dual threat. He was not fleet footed, but he could definitely pick up seven to eight yards for you at any given moment. If you know, in, in necessity or if it was necessary, I should say, but they also had an opportunity to kind of solidify that blue blood title when Vince Young won the Rose Bowl against Michigan he comes back and wins what national championship Cole McCoy wins the Fiesta Bowl comes back the following year yes he gets knocked out of a national championship game but Texas still loses that game I am of the notion that it didn't matter if Cole McCoy played that game healthy that Alabama team was just a force to be reckoned with I'd still argue still, though that they that they had a legitimate shot if he stays in that game though. I, I'm not taking away that the chances increase, but I still and I went into that game thinking that Texas is not going to beat Alabama. I didn't think that they had enough to combat how athletic that defense was. I think they I think also, this is my opinion, seeing Marcel Darius as athletic as he was playing the defensive tackle position was something that Texas could not neutralize. And of course, on the first play of the game in the first series, who knocks out Colt McCoy? Marcel Darius. I think that was the game. I, I know Marcel Darius was already being labeled as a first round pick, but that was the game that solidified that. Watching the tape prior to that game, you saw exactly what you needed to see that led up to that knockout. I don't think Texas had enough to stop that. But I do agree with you that Colt McCoy in the game makes a difference. I don't think they win that game, though. That USC-Texas game was a legitimate throw the paper out of the window, shred it, do whatever you have to do. Whoever has the ball last and makes the right play is going to win that game. So I am in agreement with you. Perennial power can't really call them a blue blood. But if they come knocking at your door to recruit you, you're going to let them in. Yeah. And I say the same for Georgia. Um, okay. So Georgia, I have a little bit more of a bone to pick with that. I'm sorry. Georgia's been more consistent lately, but Georgia... Both of us. Both of us. But, but Georgia rests on the laurels of the one championship they won in 1980. And, and I'm sorry, boys, that was 40 years ago. Um, yes, you were really consistent under Mark Richt, but were you ever actually a factor for all those years? A couple years, you could make an argument, you were one game away from breaking through. But it's always you're one game away from breaking through. Clemson had that issue for so many years until Dabo Sweeney decided to flip that flip the script on that but Georgia hasn't found their guy for that yet and yes I will absolutely say that the Kirby Smart era has been already more fruitful than the 
than the Mark Richt era. And I hate saying that because I respect Mark Richt for how consistent the man was. But it's a stain, unfortunately. It's it's a stain on, on the resume, the fact that Georgia was always a bridesmaid, never the bride, within their own conference um, for all those years, whether it was being blocked by Tennessee at one point, or being blocked by Florida, or being blocked by LSU, or being blocked by Alabama. You always were... You always were good enough to get to the SEC championship in in, in many years, but never give give it over the hump. Um, you, yes, you had the one year, um, what was it, three years ago that they uh, or two years ago that they beat um, Auburn, but you beat Auburn. You didn't beat Bama. You beat a two win a two loss Auburn team, and that was after you'd already had heartbreaks against Florida in the SEC East. Um, to not even get to the championship game for the better part of a decade. And that was years after, you know, being... It wasn't even the case of, of, of being blocked in the conference championship. There were so many years where they just couldn't win the East. Florida yeah. blocked them how many times, you know? It's, many it's, times. It's, it's, and it was always... You got dominated in that game for, for, for so yeah. long. And it's the, it's it's the rivalry game. It's it the is. you know the largest outdoor cocktail party that lets you know whoever wins that game is going to be the most successful in that division. Well, that and also and, you had the cross you had the cross conference rivalry because you also have that big rivalry with Auburn um, on the on the other side of things with the SEC West, and and Auburn used that game as as something to punch their ticket resume wise to a national championship in many years. The, the team played for two national titles on the strength of two wins against Georgia. So I, you're, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard for me to take you seriously as a true blue blood when you yourself were a punching ticket for three or four other teams in your own conference. And the fact that you can't win your own division in most years. How many SEC titles do they have since 2000? I have it right in front of me. Do you? Um, not since 2000. Since 2000, three. Three conference titles. Three. That's in 20 years, three conference titles. Do you know how many national titles they've won in the last 30 years? We already said it before. None. They, they, they have a championship in it, 1980. Top and, five finishes um, since 2000. Five of them. That's one out of every four years. And top ten finishes. I, and you know what? I want to point out one of those years was against... Oh, gosh. One of those years and those finishes was against Hawaii. In the Sugar Bowl, which I I love me some Colt Brennan, but I'm sorry that team got exposed for playing a very very weak schedule. And and, I, I, and you know what? Again, I want to make this very clear to group of five teams, especially a team like Hawaii. It is very difficult to schedule Hawaii. It is very expensive. It is, but at the same number time, two, how they were winning the games is important. They, and that in the BCS era, in the BCS era, gaudiness is what got you there, correct? No, no, no. Let me finish. Let me finish. I am not discrediting Hawaii for taking advantage of their circumstance. We can't be the pot and call the kettle black. We literally just gave this same scenario to Oklahoma and Nebraska for being in the Big Eight. What I'm saying is we knew what the outcome of that Georgia Hawaii game was going to be. I personally can't sit here and really say, okay, Georgia really beat a very tough Hawaii team. <laughs> their, their toughest opponent that they played that year was at home against Boise state. That was one of, I think just one of two top 25 teams they played all season prior to going to the sugar bowl. You said top five finishes since 2005. No, well, since, that 2000, is a top five. since 2000. It's all since 2000. I'm sorry. Even even with the case of that being one of the top five finishes, that is on the lowest list of impressive top five finishes. Okay, but I will say... It's a top say, five finish nonetheless. I know, but one thing I want to say about that, though, is that Georgia, that was one of those years where, again, they were one win away. They had the same amount of losses as LSU that year. You could have made an argument for Georgia going to the national title uh, game instead of them, but the thing is that Georgia didn't win their conference, and that's a problem. 
Georgia didn't win their conference. If they win the conference, even if you want to take the loss and throw it somewhere else, if they were if they were eleven and two at that point and they won their conference, or no, sorry, if they, yeah, if they were if they were eleven and two and won the conference instead of ten and two without a conference title, I I actually am of the argument that that two thousand and eight Georgia team was. I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying this. I actually thought they were better on a, on a week-to-week basis than the LSU team that ended up winning the title that year. But the thing is, they didn't win the game that mattered the most. And when you don't do that, you don't get to play for a title, at least in most years. I mean, I will I will mention that, I will, I will bring this to light that one team that I do have as a blue blood on this list, Alabama, took advantage of a very fortunate circumstance in 2017 where it wasn't clear who that fourth team was going to be. They lost the only game that really mattered on their schedule against Auburn and still backed their way into the playoff, but that's neither here nor there. For the purpose of this argument, it falls on Georgia again with that whole, you always are one game away, but one I'm not going to discredit them for 2008 simply because that Georgia team was legitimately ridiculous. That was a team that had no Sean Marino at, it, at his absolute peak. That was a team that had... A great defense all around, even though I couldn't tell you an individual player from it, unfortunately. But that was probably the masterpiece of Mark Rick's time in in in, in uh, Athens. And, and you had Matt Stafford, who was playing ridiculous that year as well and was a Heisman contender. And you saw that it led to him being uh, drafted number one overall. That Georgia team was so complete, and I really do think if they had a chance to play OSU, they probably would have beaten them that year. So that's the one year I'll give them credit for. But that's just one year. What about in 2005? What did you do when you won the conference title that year? You didn't play for a championship? Uh, okay, so I guess in Georgia standards, because um, I have the stats fried up because I knew Matt Stafford was going to be brought up into this, that you season was to. not It was not as great as you're making it out to be. Really? I remember them playing really dominant during the stretch. The defense played dominant. They also ran the power eye most of the time. So they were always two feature backs. Fullback is going to get involved. Stafford, by, I guess, at that era standards for a, a pro pocket passing quarterback, okay, a, 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 a shade under 3,500 yards, 25 touchdowns, but 10 interceptions. Live and die by the gunslinger. You live and die. But at the end of the day, they just like as you're making – under Mark Richt, they won every game, but that one game every single year. Perennial power, can't give them blue blood, new blood. Not at all. Now, I'm going to lump these three teams into the same category as perennial power because they all have almost a similar circumstance. Nebraska, Tennessee, Penn State. I have a little bit of a bone to pick with Nebraska, though. I think we've already made that clear earlier, but um, of these three teams, Nebraska falls harder than the other two. You said Nebraska, sorry, Nebraska, Penn State, and who? Tennessee. Um, I would make an argument that... I would make an argument Tennessee falls the hardest, actually, out of all three, instead of Nebraska. Um, okay. And here's here's why, before you get into it real quick, because I'm not sure what you're going to use as the argument there. Nebraska's had more championship success in the national level recently than Tennessee has, and I, I think it's very clear. That's because, yes. Because if you look at just the last 30 years alone, Nebraska did have the three and four. Um, I want to point out, too, uh, just to – this isn't going to help my argument, you know – against Nebraska, but ESPN Century, I don't know if you ever watched ESPN Century, had like a bracket of the greatest college football teams of all time. Yes, and Nebraska has two teams that made it into, 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 the, final. Yes. into the final. But but yes, you have 1971 Nebraska and 1995 um, Nebraska, but but Tennessee doesn't have that quote-unquote signature team that's, that's up there. Again, they have the one championship in 1998. They were the first BCS uh, champion. Great. Um, Here's the number of conference titles they have since 2000, zero, which is the same number as Nebraska. Here's the number of and times their last they... appearance. Their last appearance was against LSU in 2007. Okay, here I can I, I remember that game vividly. They lost to a backup quarterback in Ryan Perilou. 
Yes, Matt Flynn wasn't even freaking playing. But but that's but no. hang on. Yes, Tennessee has one more top five finish since two thousand. Uh, they have one, and Nebraska has zero. They have one le- one fewer top ten finish with one, and Nebraska has two. But the big thing is that the lack of conference success for both of them kind of offsets in that regard. It's the fact that Nebraska has at least won something since we've been alive, like more than once. And Tennessee has that one peak year in 1998. And outside of that, they've been almost a non-factor for the rest of the for the rest of the years. There, you you had the one year that T. Martin somehow wins a championship after Peyton Manning leaves Knoxville, and then outside of that, like they there 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 are times where they look like they're going to pull themselves out of it. Like you said, they did make the conference title game in 2007, but the fact is they lost to Ryan Perilou. In LSU. Yes, and again, and and, and I will give Les Miles credit probably was the superior coach in every single matchup that has happened in the last 20 years, especially in 2007. Um, and right now, Coach O is better than, uh, who is it, Jeremy Pruitt, I think, is the head coach at uh, Tennessee. Yeah. It, it, t- the fact is that in that specific matchup head-to-head, LSU okay. has had the coaching advantage for basically is- almost every single year. But But the point is, I, I at least put some weight on the fact that Tom Osborne existed in the last 30 years. And um, I don't if know. If he didn't, we'd, it'd be a different conversation. It, it and would. this is something that I want I want people to understand. And this is I want you guys to hold on to this nugget because I will reiterate it at the end of this segment. Is that knowing where you should coach gives you the advantage. Ed Orgeron, my humble opinion, would have had similar success at Texas. Here's why LSU made a lot more sense. The personality is of Louisiana. It's a match made in heaven, man. There's it literally a not a better heaven. fit to a single. So you school. have, so it's it's literally the difference of ninety percent compatibility to one hundred percent compatibility. Am I right or am I wrong when I say that? No, you're you're right, but at the same time, so, 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 I, so, 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 so I want you to hold on to this because this isn't something that I'm I'm necessarily like going to like make have like a make or break situation, but I have an idea. I have something that you have on your spreadsheet that I can't say I struggled with coming to terms with, but I agree with, and it is of LSU as a blue blood, new blood. I think for me. Do we put them because we've already made our considerations like Penn State. It's one of those what's understood doesn't need to be explained for LSU. Do we put them in new blood or do we put them in blue blood? I have them as blue blood. And the reason why is this. They have the championship from 19. What was it? 1958. Um, They were consistently a good performing team for a while. Yes, they didn't get over the top. But. But the point is, is that they had previous success. I think it is weighted definitely on what's happened over the last 20 years. The fact is that LSU's put over the top by that. But because they had some semblance of, of, of national relevance before that, I, I put them more on the blue blood side of things than the new blood. Um, also, that win percentage shows you that they were consistently good for a long time before recently. You don't get to 656. Right above the edge of your 650. But I'm saying, but I'm saying you don't. Out. But I'm saying you don't get to 656. The fact that only 13 of these teams qualify is 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 something. But I'm saying you don't get to 656 if you've just been doing some winning in the last 20 years. So it was it was it was coming to that point for a while. I think LSU's inclusion in, in this list is very recent. If you go back 10 years, they do not make the cut. Yeah. But it's so, very recent. But again, it's funny you bring them up because Florida State I have as a blue blood. And a lot of that is weighted on on the last 30 years, but I also have as a new blood too. Okay, I'm being told not yet. Please, elaborate. So, I differ f- with LSU from you. I, I consider more of the recent as they're pulling into blue blood, new blood. I have them more on the new blood sense, but I, I, I can't not see them winning another national championship in the next five years. I just can't not see it. 
I'm going to be completely honest with you. There's another one coming. There is another one coming. And it's because of how Orgeron recruits. He is diversifying what, like, he was not meant for the USC job. That is not a West Coast guy at all, by any means. I don't care how south of California you coach. That ain't the south, okay? There are no swampy backwoods, Hey, man, okay. he made the best of a bad situation considering what had happened. But post- that's what USC needed in the ironic sense, though. Th- isn't that something that you struggle with, like, having to deal with? Like, like as I many LSU games that I have chance. watched with Orgeron, that is something that I've always debated in my head. He was some. he was, when he took over as interim coach, head coach, he almost, I, would, I can't say almost, he saved some of the presence for USC. That's the ironic part about him not getting the job. He was ultimately a scapegoat. Now, Tom Herman bit off a lot more than he could chew by spurning LSU for Texas. The ego got in the way. Orgeron happened to just say, okay, if the keys to the Ferrari are gone and the keys to the Bentley are gone, I'm going to go ahead and take this Porsche and I'm going to keep pushing. A lot of alliteration in that. I don't care. The point remains. Yes, he took advantage of a very bad situation and saved it. I also want to point this out too. pre Orgeron, when you had the Les Miles era, the year that they did win a national championship, for all intents and purposes, should not have actually happened because of how Orgeron won his national championship with a quarterback. Les Miles dodged a huge bullet. Matt Flynn, really, dude? Really? Matt Flynn, Ethan, I don't care who you're with or what you're doing. Please convince me that Matt Flynn is a national championship winning quarterback. You had a national championship caliber quarterback in college in Jamarcus Russell, and you didn't do it with him. That's what, what really... That's what really is the head scratcher here is that you couldn't win with Jamarcus, but you won with Matt freaking Flynn. You got and there with the Ryan game, Pirillo. The ball game that they lost. Look at the ball game they lost. It was indicative of the Les Miles era. You lost on a Hail Mary to Iowa. Two tight end set the whole game. And isn't that just the most Kirk Ferentz thing you can ever think of? And it wasn't even in a a BCS bowl. It was on a New Year's Day Outback Bowl. I remember. I remember that day. I'm going to give you guys a brief story on how I saw this play fold. I'm done shoveling snow. I come in the house. I sit down in my room for 10 minutes because there's hot chocolate sitting there. I turn my TV on and all I see is Ricky Stanzi, who they plucked out of the state of Texas. God, I hate it, Stanzi. Just heave it. Just heave it. I and I'm trying it. to figure out who this team is wearing in black and gold. Like, who is this team? Why is it. LSU looking like they're going to lose? I, 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 I hated Stanzi so much. As an OSU, as an OSU alum, I, I freaking hated Ricky Stanzi. That, that dude was not a good quarterback, but for some reason would step up whenever he played us. And I, it, it, it pissed me off so much it's kind of like how Purdue's quarterback goes from being a one-star recruit to being a four-star recruit whenever they play us right in the heart heart. what they got a national championship out of that Les Miles era era Orgeron made it made it clear and I want to make this clear too because this is an ego that's talking this isn't even putting ego aside that's talking this is simply facts Joe Burrow was the most important rec- football recruit LSU had in the last 10 years. Orgeron said that himself. You're welcome, by the way, Baton Rouge. Ohio State alumnus Joey Burrow. Let's point that out. Who would have been the starter if he didn't thumb, get freaking hurt. Broken thumb. Take Martell slides up. Well, hang on. Wasn't he also supposed to take over instead of of Dwayne Haskins? I thought it was him versus Haskins for the starter role. So Haskins edged him out. But then in a game, Burrow breaks his thumb and misses six weeks. 
Tate Martell slides up, gets more game reps. So who are you going to take at that point? The person that's got more game film? And in, 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 in a powerhouse team like Ohio State's, like, you're going to take the person that has the game film as the coach, right? We don't have to get into that because there's multiple successes between Joey Burrow, Ohio State, LSU that, you know, made one of the craziest college football seasons for at least for us as Ohio State grads. It made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense. LSU, for you, blue blood, me, newer blood. They're new blood. But you could you could really have an argument on which era was the best because of the the 50s and Billy Cannon and what they were really able to do, revolutionizing the differences in the sweep game for running backs. Nonetheless, you have to respect them. Nonetheless. Right. Now, because you jumped the gun a little bit, because this is my favorite argument. I got very giddy with this because I have them on both lists. I know. And I had them I had the I had the same four teams down as my new bloods too. <laughs> so Well the new bloods I think are actually even easier. The new bloods let's just get that out there for everybody listening. Yeah, the new but bloods it's a are, fun it's a fun argument. I'm gonna let you there you go. Just real quick, I think the new bloods are actually very clear cut to me. Very clear cut because you do have to win titles to be in a new blood, so I'm not gonna put teams that have risen but have not gone over the hill yet or have not have not reached the pinnacle it's it's four teams it's florida miami florida state clemson that's it. okay and i want everybody to 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 really i want you guys to really take this in three of those schools are from the same state right why in the f has it taken this long Ethan, because why Flo- the F has okay. it taken this long? The reason why is that Florida, for some reason, did not do a good job of keeping its own talent in state until the last 40 years. For whatever reason, they would always get pilfered by its surrounding territories. Which, for some reason, the rest of the country figured on. out Florida produces ball players before Florida actually produces. To your point, to your point, a team that's not even in this consideration took advantage of the Florida pipeline, Georgia Tech is one of those teams that took advantage because Atlanta is a very respectable city to live in for, for life, right? They took advantage of that Florida pipeline. So did Texas A&M and Auburn. Other two other teams because Auburn couldn't get the Alabama talent that Alabama was getting. At one point, you could arguably say that what Auburn was to Alabama, because the Iron Bowl is the Iron Bowl, but at one point, Alabama dominated, was kind of what Ohio State is to Cincinnati. Like, Cincinnati kind of got the scraps of Ohio, but had to really dig into Kentucky. Point remains here. When you're talking about the New Bloods and premier programs... Three are in the same state. The fourth, as you alluded to maybe just five minutes ago, getting over the hump, Clemson. Yes. And holy crap, they've they've gotten over the hump. They went from being that punched line. It, there was even a term for it, Clemsoning, which if you're Dabo Sweeney, I'm not sorry I'm using that. I don't like you right now. It's purely for professional reasons. But that, that was a, it was a joke every year. They couldn't win the big game. They were always one game away. They were always that one key matchup away. But holy crap has the image changed. Now Clemson is up there with Alabama as, as one of the surest bets to win big games. In fact, when they lose, I'm surprised. It, it, when they lose to anyone, I'm shocked. I expect them to go 14-15-0 every year. At this point, just how good they are. Like Legitimately, it, it upsets me how consistently dominant that team has been over the last half decade it it, it it's but it, at the same time it's the last half decade that is new blood if i've ever seen it and the thing about how they're doing it is not just with the consistency of the recruiting but the consistency of all three phases of the game they have won a game in every single phase in this last half decade 
I credit, and I mean with all due respect to the savior, Trevor Lawrence, not even Deshaun Watson, (laughs) but his former Taj Boyd, he was able to corral. He was the quarterback that changed the game for them. In a similar sense, for Florida, Chris Leak. People remember the names, but they were not talents in the NFL, right? But they were guys that helped get the team over the hump for notoriety reasons. The exception is Taj Boyd. His final hoorah was a win against us in the Orange Bowl. That wasn't Taj Boyd. That was Sammy that was Frickin- Taj Boyd? No, no, it was, but I'm saying the guy I'm going oh, to credit for that was Sammy Watkins. Watkins. That was, that was Sammy, Sammy Watkins, Watkins but... was the thing that put them over the top. 200 yards <laughs> receiving and, like, what, 15,000 receptions. No, it was Sammy Watkins. Let's be clear here. If that man's not playing football, Taj Boyd that. doesn't have anything resembling the game that, he but, did. But finding that quarterback that starts and gets what your philosophy is is, 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 is the point I'm getting at. We know Chris Leak was not what changed that game for Florida. Their defense is what changed that game for Florida. Well, it also didn't help that Ted Ginn Jr. happened to injure himself on that kickoff return for the touchdown. It wasn't his fault. He got his ankle stepped on in the celebration pile. Right, but I'm saying that didn't didn't help either, though. You took away Troy Smith's best deep deep ball threat. So, like, I, I... Again, it, no excuse. They lost the game, what, 41-10? to 10? It wasn't even particularly close. But but my point is this. I Actually, you know what? I'm not going to make my point because we're arguing an individual matchup. Go ahead. Go go back. Yeah, that, that's indivi- that. that's, that's individual matchup. The point I'm making is there was a quarterback for these teams that, that made a difference, right? Mm-hmm. With the exception of Miami. Miami did something totally different. They did something totally different. You're gonna tell me Ken Dorsey wasn't a lead? Hold on, I'm not. I'm not bashing Ken Dorsey here. The point I am making, though, for Miami, is their recruiting. If you watch the thirty for thirty, if the pre- the school president doesn't get on board, just like Dabo Sweeney's president at Clemson, doesn't get on board with shifting some resources toward football, that doesn't happen. So what were those resources shifted to? I don't know. Let's step outside of Coral Gables, Florida, where the University of Miami is actually located, and step outside 10 minutes into the urban areas and give these kids a chance. They can ball. Years later, Booker T. Washington High School and Miami Northwestern, Ja'Cory Harris, Teddy Bridgewater, two most notable quarterbacks who have played in the city of Miami. Those are the high schools that ended up changing the lore of football for Miami. Okay, and it was one guy who was responsible for doing this for decades. Say, say his name. Howard his Schnellenberger name. is literally the reason why Miami football was what say it was. Say his name again. Howard Schnellenberger. That, it's not Jimmy Johnson, y'all. It's Howard Save Schnellenberger. It, it, without Howard Schnellenberger, Jimmy Johnson doesn't do what he does. No one does what they do. Dennis Erickson doesn't do what he does. People don't know this name. People do not know this name. Howard Schnellenberger literally put that school on the map. He was the one that decided, we have so much talent in our own backyard. Why are we not recruiting this more heavily? He was the guy. He is... For all intents and purposes, the guy that built it. He is, to Miami football, what you would consider someone like... Um, a Bear a Bryant example? is to a Alabama. A Bear Bryant is to Alabama, or what Woody Hayes is to, to Ohio State. He is the foundation builder of the success of that program. Or the and, city of Toledo, or the Toledo greater area is to Michigan football. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Because I think people will forget... And as I was saying about Taj Boyd and Chris Leak, they were essentially the architects to the system that helped these teams gain relevance. We know what Sammy Watkins did. We had to sit there, Ethan. We were roommates at the time when we when we watched that game. I want you guys to understand that that's how long I've known Ethan. 
I've known Ethan that long. Okay, I want to also bring up a point. Um, we can we can credit Taj Boyd, but I'd argue that the the source of Clemson's uprising is twofold or threefold because you also got to throw Dabo Sweeney in there. But I'd also argue that Steve Spurrier gets some credit for for whooping that ass. Pardon my language, for for oh, for, for, oh, for getting yeah. the better part of that rivalry in the mid two thousands. Um, yeah. That losing your in-state rivalry to USC East, which has never been considered a power, and losing it to a guy like Steve Spurrier, who you're not going to hear the end of it from. Who well, only probably took the job to get the last laugh at Florida. Yeah, he, did he took Florida the job too. to he took the job basically to get a chance to get back at Florida. It was that was a spiteful acceptance spiteful. of a job of of a and job. And they uh, named the field after him as he was coaching them. Yeah. Oh. And and that's the thing. Um Steve Spurrier, I I love me some Steve Spurrier, man. That 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 guy is literally the most petty individual that's ever coached college football and it's great. And, and he has a Heisman trophy. Yes, he does. And like, people forget guys, that. The 1966 like... Heisman trophy award winner is Steve Spurrier. <laughs> but my point is this, right? I think to a certain extent you can almost consider the rise of, of Clemson to be an indirect result of just being bodied in the rivalry with South Carolina in the mid two thousands, mid to late two thousands. And it was Why? really it was really in two thousand eight when you were just like, Oh my god, we gotta stop losing. We gotta stop going to Columbia and getting our asses kicked that that they said to themselves, Yeah, something's gotta change. Something has to change and I think that's what really spurred the 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 decision to really go from having Dabo as the interim to being the head uh, permanent. And there hasn't been a single head coaching hire that's been better over the last, you know, 15 years. And I'd argue it's even better than the hire of Nick Saban to Alabama because that, to me, is a no-brainer. I, you can say what you want about his time in Miami, but the fact is, and I'm going off on a tangent, but I'll, I'll get back on track after this. I think you can, this you can, count because we're you, talking about two different coaching you, cases you, as, you, as an area. You, but I'm saying I give Clemson more credit because Dabo was a little bit more of an unknown you you had a slam dunk hire in Saban. Say what you want about what he did in Miami. The fact is that he was two games under 500. He was 15 and 17, and he did it with a with a front office that did not want to take his opinion into regard. He wanted to go after Drew Brees in free agency, and they had no interest in it. Or actually, I think it was a trade. They wanted to go after Drew Brees as far as a trade, and they were like, no, we got Dante Culpepper. We're good. And we saw how that turned out for them. But... That man left Miami because he knew he didn't have the same totalitarian control that he did at LSU when he won a championship. And in my mind, in hindsight, you give Nick Saban – you don't just give Nick Saban keys to the car. You give him keys to everyone else's car too because he's going to be the one that's going to drive that whole organization. Yep. He should have had Belichick-type control or Pete Carroll-type control within his own organization. But that's a slam-dunk hire. In hindsight, the last time that, that – that, the man was coaching college ball he had only known success at that point so for alabama to go out and take to go out on a limb on nick saban after two years in the nfl wasn't really going out on much of a limb no because so, he had he won a national championship at lsu right but i'm saying you you if you're clemson you're doing whatever you can you're kind of just throwing stuff at a wall hoping it sticks but but Dabo, he, hang on. With Dabo, the reason why is Dabo wasn't particularly super impressive in his audition for the role of head coach, even as the interim. My point is this: you you taking a chance on him and and and, and giving him time because the fact is that he didn't really start having the sustained sustained success until 2011 was the first year I think he won 10 games. It took a few years to get his footing. But the fact that they hired him and they were patient enough with him and they saw the changes that were slowly happening in the program with regards to recruiting, with regards to playing in big games, with regards to development and coaching of certain players, Taj Boyd being a great example of a development of a guy, and Sammy Watkins being an example of development of a guy. Them, them holding pat with him and not going out and trying to make a flashy hire instead is one of the all-time best decisions I've ever seen from, from, from an athletic department. But it's the same hire that gets pitched all the time, though. And this is what I meant by, from an Ed Orgeron standpoint, of best fit. Dabo was the better fit for the job. And when you have that better fit for the job, especially one of a Dabo Sweeney caliber, who was a bit unknown, what was the first power move that Dabo Sweeney made? 
that changed the Clemson organization? Who did he steal? You're going to have to remind me on that one. I'm sorry. Brent Venables, the defensive coordinator who was at Oklahoma. That was that let people that let the Clemson faithful know that Dabo is invested. What did he do when he hired Brent Venables? Made him the highest paid defensive coordinator in college football history. This is over also at the time of Frank Beamer with Bud Foster. So you have to understand that it's not just the player mentality. It's also your support staff. You stole Brent Venables from an already solidified situation because he was technically the predecessor to Bob Stoops before big, he left. Big game Bob. Big game Bob. <laughs> and he got one of them. I, it's the best ironic nickname that's ever been created. This is oh my gosh! Like and and I I still remember the one versus five matchup against Texas and and Texas won by ten, and people just kept and all the Texas faithful just kept chanting "Big Game Bob." I like I won't forgive them because of what they did to poor Texas Tech. Texas Tech was that one Oklahoma went away from playing for a national championship. Never forget if they beat Oklahoma. They play for the Natty that year. They do. And the craziest national championship race of not just BCS history, but of probably of any. 2008 Big Big 12 South is is by far my favorite interdivision race in modern college football history. And then you had then you, you can't you can't discount the fact that Oklahoma and Missouri. We're also cannibalizing at the same time um, because of all the intents and purposes. That Big 12 was the best conference in the country. Well, that Big 12 South was the best division in the country individually, period. You had three teams who all went 11-1 and one and all beat each other. And it was every single week, it was something new. The Michael Crabtree catch to this day is one of the few times I shouted in my house and my mother didn't discipline me for just yelling and waking people up late at night. She said, what the just happened? And I showed her the replay and she said, oh, I don't know about football, but that was kind of impressive. I was like, you see, the call is still ingrained in my mind. Crabtree pulls free is one of my favorite college football calls of all time. One of my favorite moments happened after the fact, too, of that call. The student section yanks the first row bleacher out of the ground. And they, they also moved celebrated the with two back. seconds left on the clock, too. They celebrated. Yep. They had to there move everybody. Yes. be like, all right, guys, now, seriously, get the hell back in the stands. We you got still got game. Seconds. We got two seconds left. And who was the quarterback on the other side? Colt McCoy. Graham Harrell. What? No, no, no. I'm saying oh, about for, Texas, uh, for Texas. For Texas. Who was oh, the quarterback oh, on the other what? side? Graham Har- No, no, no. It was Colt McCoy. But I'm saying, if there's one guy at that point in college that I didn't want to piss off and give two seconds, it was Colt McCoy. And I just, I, I, I always felt at that point in time, at that moment, I thought, okay, this is too good to be true. This is not a, a, a thing that usually happens. Something's going to happen. McCoy is going to somehow launch a prayer, and then normalcy is going to be restored. And when that didn't yep. <laughs> happen, I was I was still shocked. I like we both woke up that morning thinking it didn't happen. A Colt McCoy miracle did not happen. Right, and and again, it's Texas Tech again. Teams that rely on the air raid and have no defense typically don't win games like that. They don't win big games. You saw it with June Jones at Hawaii. Teams that are like that don't win big games against complete teams. And Texas was a complete team. Mac Brown is a championship winning head coach. That is a team that is considered one of the premier powers in the history of college football. This is Texas Tech, who was an upstart at that point. A very good offense. No defense. And the fact is that Mike Leach was not a guy who exactly imposed a defensive-minded strategy in his teams or even a balanced offensive strategy. Can you name a running back from Texas Tech over the last 20 years that had any sort of 
notable success at the pro level and had any name, name a Texas Tech running back with 1500 yards in the last 20 years I dare you I don't know I can't I can't give you one but I also want to point this out about the game um it was mentioned on ESPN like there's a history behind this and I think you guys should probably delve into it but there is some historical presence that happens when the home team wears all black during Halloween weekend <laughs> Because that was November 1st. The day before was Halloween. I want you guys to really do your history on teams that have black in their uniforms. And they have all black uniforms. And they host a top 25 matchup at home. History is always on their side. This is not me making this up on the fly. This is facts. Look it up. Halloween weekend isn't called spooky weekend for no reason. Remember the last time that there was a spooky weekend and a college football team ranked number two in the country? went down or number one i'll give you 2011 iowa state beats fucking oklahoma state yes i swore i got it but you you dropped that you dropped that i dropped that i mean we're not gonna get monetized at all for this anyway but like still (laughs) i had to drop this because i need people to understand that halloween weekend presents trouble man and at the time we're talking about the craziest national championship race in all of college football history. It didn't matter. Because as Ethan was saying, complete teams are not supposed to lose that game. Texas Tech was about as one-sided as you could get. Even the high-potent Missouri offense had a, a, a dominant defensive line and a very athletic linebacking court. Oklahoma, you just couldn't you just couldn't get your defense off the field. That that was that was it. I'm can sorry. A, can I get just, a shout out from my boy Chase Daniel? Guy has been in the NFL forever and has made a ton of money just being a career backup. That is the dream. Chase Daniel, yes, I'm sure he had bigger visions for himself at the pro level, but Chase Daniel can't be ashamed about that. But let's let's get back let's get back to to the point you were making. I'm sorry, I just had to shout out my boy. He's got know, a Super Bowl that, ring and everything, but oh gosh, does. <laughs> the and, Adam and we're Morrison not hating on Chase. The, we're not hating on Chase Daniel at all. Adam Morrison of the NFL, my friend. The Adam Morrison of the NFL, with the exception that Chase Daniel has led when he had the start. He has led his team to a couple wins. I'll give him that. Bro, Ammo, I don't, I don't Ammo, think... Ammo's been held back. That guy could have been the goat. So I don't know what you're talking about. It's a terrible, terrible argument. Chase Daniel also had the. The, the, the furthest shotgun snap of life. My gosh, I thought that he was going to get sacked before the ball touched his hands, man. He stood deep in the backfield. Chase Daniel is... I just remember him as being the other dude in that Heisman race in 2008. I was like, yeah, you got you got a bunch of guys in there. I, I can't even freaking remember the whole race. I was just like, yeah, you got Tim Tebow. You had... um. Oh God! Who finished? Uh, t- you had Tim Tebow, you had Darren McFadden, you had Colt Brennan, and it's just like and Chase Daniel. And then you look at Chase Daniel's sets, and I'm like, damn, that guy is the second best quarterback in the SEC. <laughs> yes, yes. And, it, and Jeremy Macklin was the receiver he was throwing to, but the point still remained that when you looked up and it's like, oh, he only finished fourth. Wow, the fact that he even got invited. He got invited because he was the second best quarterback as conference, and his team actually was a national title contender. But like that was a guy who was in a perfect situation at a perfect time. We all knew that Tim Tebow was going to win it that year. That, that was the worst kept secret in, in college football. But Darren McFadden also was the only other guy, really, that actually you you figured had a shot. He had the Adrian Peterson curse. But but I'm saying he was the only one because you knew okay Colt Brennan got invited right. He probably deserved it the year before that when he threw 58 touchdowns, and even then you weren't going to give it to him. The the year – oh, no, this sorry. This was a different year. My bad. This was during the – what was it? The 07 08, No, it was. This was the 07 08 season, right? The 07 08 season. So Tim Tebow wasn't up for Heisman no, no. consider. He was uh, no, no. a freshman. No, no, no. Tebow won it in 07 08. I was thinking of 08 09. 08 09 was the, was the Sam Bradford year that he won it. I think 07 08. 06 07. I'm thinking 06 07. No, 06 07, 07 was when Brennan threw for 58 touchdowns. 07 08 was when Tebow had 50 total touchdowns. He had like 30 passing touchdowns and like 20 on the ground. And you knew he was going to get it. <laughs> anyway, back to the main point we were discussing. Um, see, this is this is what happens when uh, 
This is how it happened. I want to shift back to the Blue Blood stuff because I still haven't revealed my list, man. And I was really so, excited about that. I'm 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 anxious for you to reveal your list of your Blue Bloods, New Bloods. Okay, well let's just get to it. I'm gonna just state. I'm just gonna start with the 13 schools that I had as contenders and rattle them off real quick. The contenders were Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame, Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas, USC, Nebraska, Penn State, Tennessee, Florida State, LSU, Georgia. The teams that I actually picked were Ohio State, and I'll say the reasons for each as I go. Ohio State, maybe along with Oklahoma and USC, the three most consistent programs of the last 80 years. Um, they they pretty much didn't go any long stretches without being relevant and, and contending for titles. Ohio State has basically been second only to Alabama in the last 20 years in terms of consistency, and you can make an argument they were more consistent because Alabama had a down period up until the Nick Saban era really began. So, uh, Ohio, so Ohio State, realistically, if we're going back to the Mike Shula era, we do have to we do have Mike. to figure we do have to figure that into into things. But Ohio State, maybe the most consistent program in college football history, either them, Oklahoma, or USC, and I'd really argue it's Ohio State, Alabama. Because most most national titles uh, from the consensus era, the poll era, um, they were basically a factor almost every single decade except for like the late 90s to mid 2000s, and um, now they they sit atop the throne every year with with Clemson. But uh, Oklahoma, for reasons kind of the same to Ohio State, not really any significant down periods, ton of titles. Um, and they, they just contend every year, and you can make an argument that they've dominated their conference over the last 20 years just about as, as as much as any other team. In fact, they have the most conference titles since 2000 of any Power 5 team with 13. Um, you've got USC, who, for the same reasons Ohio State and Oklahoma, consistency, 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 ton of titles, rich history, um, no significant down periods. If you want to say the most significant down period, you can talk about what's happened over the last 10 years. But even then, you always get the feeling they're right around the corner. I do think Clay Helton is one good recruiting class away from really turning that team around. But um, it's coming. It I, is. I'm going to interrupt you briefly. It's coming. It's it's coming. That team has just too much of a recruiting advantage and too much of a risk history to not recover. That's not. They're not going to be a Tennessee. They're not going to be a Nebraska. That's a team that has too much. Uh, inertia behind them. Uh, Florida State, both the New Blood and the Blue Blood. The reason why is that Florida State has a 672 win percentage. They were a consistent factor even before they started winning titles with Bobby Bowden. Uh, and just what they did over over the course of, of 15 years, basically from the early 90s to the mid 2000s and finishing 14 years straight in the top five is just an insane run. Um, and I know that that's only a decade and a half, but that's just an insane run of consistency. And again, they've been a factor the last decade and a half, too. So for 30 years, they've been probably the premier program in Florida, even over Miami. Um, LSU, for reasons we highlighted before, you know, they had considerable success even with one championship. They still were a factor for, for quite a few decades. And then recently, they've been put over the top by that dominance in the last, you know, 20 years. Um, that's it. It's those six teams, though, Ohio State, Alabama, Oklahoma, USC, Florida State, LSU. And again, I say this, it's a revolving door. Any of those other teams can get back in. It might, there might be a team eventually from the, from a team that's not on those 13 teams that could get in. But who knows? If Clemson keeps this up for another 10 years, we might be talking about them. So, again, it, it really depends. And again, that, that, that time frame is also a little bit subjective. All of this is subjective. But recency does matter which is why again the most notable admission uh the most notable um you know remissions from my list um or uh sorry omissions the most notable omissions from my list michigan notre dame texas and then you can argue about nebraska penn state tennessee georgia but the most notable omissions are michigan notre dame and texas and the reason why is that lack of recent success especially especially and, and I know a lot of people are going to say, well, Michigan, right? No. Notre Dame. Notre Dame is the one that I want to talk about. Notre Dame hasn't won a national title since 1988. Notre Dame, I forget the conference titles, has had two top five finishes since 2000. Three top ten finishes, which is actually the more damning one to me, because at least Michigan has six of them. Double the amount of top ten finishes in the last 20 years. 
And to me, top ten's the cutoff for, for being nationally relevant um, in terms of contending for a title, because chances are if you were not in the top ten in most cases, you probably weren't contending for a title for most of the year. Yes, there are certain cases where maybe a team went 10-0 and 0 and then just stopped and fell off a cliff. But in most cases, 90% of cases, if you didn't finish in the top 10, you probably weren't contending all year. Or you weren't contending consistently throughout the year. The fact that Notre Dame has a lack of that has only, what, 15% if you go by 3 out of 20? 15% of seasons in, 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 in the new millennium? That's not going to cut it for me. And, and same thing with Michigan, the fact they have you know one national title since World War II. They have three conference titles since the turn of the century. Zero top five finishes. It, and, and, and again, with Texas, which is probably the least pathetic out of all three of those instances, yes, you had the 2005 championship with Mack Brown. You had the Rose Bowl victory the year before that, and you had a championship appearance in 2010 with Colt McCoy. But you've been bodied in your own conference by Oklahoma for the longest time. You can't even win your own division. I can't. LSU got over the hump of Alabama a few years. LSU's on this list despite playing in the same division as Alabama. Actually, the two national championship wins that LSU has, they got over the Alabama. And that's the point I'm going to make, is the fact that you don't have to be the team in your conference to get over that hump. But you have to be pretty damn close, and you have to eventually get one up on the other guy. The fact is is that it's... I have six here listed, and only one conference has two of them, and they come from the same division, the SEC West, and it's Alabama and LSU. But uh, we'll go back um, to to all of this. It's just it's those six teams, and I understand my hot take is that Michigan and Notre Dame are a hundred percent in terms of branding. Even Texas, those are college football institutions. When you think of of college football history, and you have to pick ten programs, those might be in your top five in terms of branding. It's, it's for me, recency does play a factor. Yes, there's a lot of weight behind what you've done over, you know, 70, 80, 90 years. But if you don't show up in the last 30, that's, that's a quarter of your history that you're just absent for. Notre Dame does not mean as much as it used to. Michigan does not mean as much as it used to. And Texas doesn't mean as much as it used to. Nebraska fell hard. Penn State's starting to come back, but hasn't hasn't sustained their comeback long enough yet for me to put them back in. Tennessee is a dumpster fire, and I don't know when the heck they're going to turn a corner. I, I'm, I sometimes wonder if Tennessee will ever have glory days again. And Georgia just, they're consistent contenders right now, but let's see them do it for a little bit longer. And for God's sakes, win a title. It's, it's those six teams. And again, the legendary teams, I 100% would include Michigan, Notre Dame, in that list. I'd even make an argument for Texas. Absolutely. Um, but if we're talking about who the established Blue Bloods are right now in terms of current relevance and historical power, it's Ohio State, Alabama, Oklahoma, USC, Florida State, LSU. It's those six, and I will not extend it past. Period. Okay. So my Blue Bloods, because I have it split up between Blue Bloods, New Bloods. So I'll Okay, for easier. I have LSU as a new blood. I think the the recency is stronger than what happened in the past. But nonetheless, that is an argument I can have with myself as blue blood, new blood. But Miami, Florida State, Clemson, Florida round out my new bloods. Get that out of the way. I agree with you in a sense with Alabama. Ohio State, Oklahoma, and USC. I still, as a blue blood, will consider Notre Dame as one, only because the highs outweigh the lows. I can give them the benefit of the doubt. There's also a debate of whether or not Notre Dame has 10 or 11 national championships, because there is one that some are saying they don't claim from 1953. Here's my thing with Notre Dame. There are more dominant eras than not. And even in the flat moments in those dominant eras, they have they've taken advantage of with those. If it's an 11 game season going nine, one and one or going ten and one, whatever have you. Their fall off is totally different than a Michigan. 
My thing with Michigan is almost parallel to Texas in that I can consider them perennial powers. Yes, Michigan was one of the very first teams, you know, especially in the 1900s to have a college football program, but a lot of those national championships, and I know we make the joke, but were against high school teams. I don't care about how many you've won, what actually counts. There are eras where teams have split national championships. Has Michigan been in any of those conversations of a split national championship? Yes. No. Oh wait, which one? 1997. They split the national championship. Right. They were they were the um, I was they were the, of uh, the totally different. They were the AP totally national. Different. Yeah, they were yeah, AP national champions totally in '97, and the coaches went to uh, Nebraska that year. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking of something totally different in the sense of Michigan, and I, I don't think it was splitting, but I think it was the fairness of an outright championship in unfair playing conditions. Well, you had those back, championships that I don't consider. Well, that was that was back when you didn't have that was pre BCS that was pre having an established criteria for one versus two that was when you had the con- the the bowls have the coalitions themselves but um, you had agreements you know Ohio uh, Michigan had the tie in with the Big Ten with the with the Rose Bowl and uh, back then you know the big uh, I think that was still the big was that the Big Eight era or was that Big Twelve finally um, uh, in 1997. Well. I think the Big 12 existed at that point. Might have been Big 12. Big 12 had the one is Big 12. But the Big 12 had a tie-in with a different bowl game back then. I think the Big 12 had the tie-in with the Fiesta Bowl, if I if I remember correctly, back then. Um, So I I think it was yeah I think it was Big 12 versus at large at that point still, or it might have been Big 12 versus someone else. But um, you you had you had the Rose Bowl tying in with the with the you know Big 10 winner and the Pac 12 winner um, back then, and it still does, but. Um, it, it, you, you had at that point, you know, teams that you weren't going to get one and two in most cases because you had the Pac-12 winner in Washington State that ended up playing them. Washington State was not in contention for a national championship that year, realistically. So everything before 1998 essentially is, was kind of like the wild, wild west to a certain extent. Um, it's why split championships were a lot more prevalent back, th- uh, back then. You had 1991 where, uh, Miami claims a championship, but so does Washington, 1990, I believe, is Colorado and Georgia Tech. Like, you had back-to-back years where you had split national champions. That's not going to happen in today's day and age. You're never going to see a split champion a fair, ever again. right system. Well, so, fair is very hard to say, but we have an outright system. Yeah, but but to, your, but, but to your point, I, I, actually, I actually would say that the split in the national championship thing doesn't matter to me because if a major selector picks you, I'm fine with that. I consider that a consensus title. I consider an AP championship in 1997 to be a consensus title. Okay, so same thing with 2003 with South with USC and LSU yes. splitting. I consider those both national championships. I consider USC yes. back-to-back champions despite the fact that they only won the um, that they only won the uh, AP championship in uh, 2003 rather than Which, both. again, they had to absolve because too much controversy for who split, who's no, outright. No, 2003 they get to keep. 2004 was the one they had to get rid of. 2003 they got to keep. 2004 well, 2003, was... well, there was a lot of controversy that led to them absolving that, that, that split. So 2003 was the last year that they allowed that. So there, what I'm saying is there is an outright system for national champions. Oh, I thought you were talking about. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the. I thought you were talking about the ineligibility of, of Reggie Bush and how they stripped no, USC no, of the no, 2004 no, no, title. No, no, no. First of all, ruin the culture. I might have disrespect Reggie Bush, but <laughs> you scapegoated. It's BS. I, I don't think. I, I think that that was horse crap. And the fact is that when they allowed him back, and they embraced him last year. Um, I, it was about damn time in my eyes. I don't think he ever should have been shunned on campus, ever. But back to your point about the about absolving the the splits yeah. for championships. So now that we have that, this is where my conflict comes in with both Michigan and Notre Dame. Just as because this isn't even a bias against Michigan. Why I have Notre Dame as in my blue blood. And it's for the fact that in certain eras of flatness, they have been able to hold on a lot longer and stronger than Michigan has. Neither team took advantage of anything since <laughs> what the 90s taking advantage of anything. 
Okay. I mean, for Notre Dame, it's been longer. Okay, so, but again, even even previously though, there are eras where both Michigan and Notre Dame were dominant, but Notre Dame edges them out. Like, and I think one of those eras is the Catholics versus convicts, and I, I hate that moniker, but the battles with Miami meant more. The Michigan Ohio State rivalry, second to none, is the greatest rivalry in college sports. Another podcast idea for another day. I feel like the next one that we're going to tackle, there's an argument for Notre Dame, uh, for uh, UNC Duke in basketball that's up there. Also, people in the South will make an argument that the Iron Bowl means just as much, but, um, but I. Really? Again, I I also consider that to be more one-sided. I think Alabama historically dominates that in terms of both championships and head-to-head, um, whereas at least with Ohio State, Michigan, they're separated by less than ten, and both teams have won a significant amount of championships. Although Ohio State has more real titles. Sorry. No, not sorry. Not sorry about that at all. But that's my blue blood and new blood list. These are also teams that I have. If we're tearing them in my tier one, mid to high tier one, with probably with the exception of a Notre Dame, especially the last seven years. But nonetheless, I feel, again, this is all subjective. You can argue with me until you're blue in the face. They're still going to be in my blue blood, pun intended. I don't care. Here's the thing about Notre Dame, bud, and I, I have to put that in here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say it. You do realize that if Ohio State self-sanctioned in 2011 and not in 2012, that Notre Dame doesn't probably doesn't. Well, actually, they do play for the championship, but uh, never mind. They did. Get, they'd still play. I was going to say they they weren't going to play for a championship in 2012, but they weren't going to get passed over for Alabama. It would have yeah, been Ohio State another, versus Notre Dame. That's another recency, I guess you know, recency bias that I'm having over Michigan is that. While it wasn't a, a, a proper showing of a national championship <laughs> team in a national championship game, they got spanked. Again, I, I'm sorry, Manti one, Teo got exposed. The one time they actually played for a title in the last 30 years, and again, I think it's their only national title appearance since 19 since since that championship in '88. The only one after that was in 2013. In, in that game, in January 2013, and they got exposed. Manti Teo was made to look just amateurish. Who was the who was the uh, running back that, back then? That wasn't Trent Richardson, was it? I think it was the running back after Richardson, was it not? Point is, is that can you tell me can you tell me who the um who the quarterback was back then? Was that AJ McCarron? Might have been AJ McCarron or Greg McElroy. No, Greg McElroy was first. He was in the so, um. He was the one that started it when they beat Texas. It was AJ so McCarron, right? That was the one when when Brent Musburger was just like, "Look at his girlfriend, girlfriend right there. Yeah, look how cute she is. Oh my goodness!" And then all of us at home were just like, "That's a little uncomfortable, Brent. Don't know how that's relevant to the game." Yeah, this is like, this this is not like. You, if you've played Pokemon and you've accidentally hit select trying to ride your bike in the Pokemart, there's a time and place for everything. Get out of my head, Oak. Get out of my damn head. There is a time and place for everything. That wasn't the time nor the place for that. And that national championship game was also cringing for another reason for the catfish fake girlfriend. But I want to point out that Manti Teo moves as fast as a bear would move in molasses with concrete shoes. Like, he couldn't do anything, and Eddie Lacy made him look ridiculous when they met in the gap. I won't point that out. But anyway, that's my list. Ethan has his list. To give you guys a, a bit of a, a segue... This is going to be a two-parter because we are now going to hash over this, get this published, and we're going to do Blue Bloods, New Bloods of 
college basketball. Which I am just full disclosure way less knowledgeable about but i will still try to hold my own in that one but i again i we're not going to complicate things i've already told you i won't complicate things i think i'm going to be less strict for that one than i am for this one the reason why i wanted to be strict for this is because i knew that in college football the list was a little bit larger than it was in college basketball and i really wanted to wean it down a little bit um the fact is if i wasn't being as strict that list is probably, instead of six, probably closer to like nine or ten. But I really, really wanted to make it very clear that I hold that label of blue blood, at least the connotations that's, put, that's been put behind it, I hold it in an extremely high regard. And yes, that's, that, that's, that's why I've hope. been extremely strict with that criterion. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot of teams that I spurned. I spurned teams like... Uh, I won't say teams like Minnesota because, I'm sorry, I don't give a crap that you won six ch- titles if you haven't done anything since the 1960s. Uh, Michigan State, yeah, I mean, they're consi- they are they had their consistency period, but they won five titles. Last one came, I think, in the late 50s or early 60s. Um, Texas A&M had, like, four, but they haven't won one since, like, the 1940s, I think. Uh, to me, title counts are only part of it. But I'm spurning teams like Auburn, who have won a national championship recently and were consistent for a long time. You know, I'm 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 spurning a team like that, um, and that's the first one that really comes to mind. I'm I'm not putting someone like a Florida on my blue blood list because most of their championship success came very recently. While they were definitely consistent for a while, they could never get over the hump until the Steve Spurrier days, and so that weighed in a little bit. I mean. I say that despite having Florida State on here and Bobby Bowden not getting his first title until 1993. But even then, Florida State had a little bit more weight to it because Florida State was just that much more consistent in terms of factoring into the national title picture than Florida was back then. Florida was also ducking Miami. I want to put that out there. I want to put that out there. I mean, everybody was ducking Miami back then, to be quite honest. Florida was ducking Miami. Any Florida fans that hear this, you know you know what's real. Dude, everyone was ducking Miami. What Miami did from 1983, I, forget the 20-year span. Forget 1983 to 2002. What Miami was doing from 1983 to 1991 was ridiculous. Those That's nine years. Even that. They, I was going to say, not even the full extent of a decade. They won they four titles in a, in a nine-year span across three different head coaches. It's, it's, people, people forget because we're so far removed from that era of college football, but Miami was, was the team. Back Let me in put the late, a bridge. In the, in the mid eighties to the early nineties, Miami was that team. Let me put a bridge onto that era and to what we see in the NFL today. Vinny Testaverde. Dude, what a Heisman trophy, man through 275 touchdowns, I think, at the NFL level, like, had a good career. I mean, he's notable for Jet fans for being uh, nicknamed Interceptiverde because the guy couldn't get through a game without throwing a, without committing a key turnover, but he's legit. Um, But you, you have, you have a Hall of Fame head coach in Jimmy Johnson, you have a Hall of Fame coach in Howard Schnellenberger, uh, who was it that was the other coach? Was it Erickson, I think, was the, was the other guy that was in there? Erickson was... I think he was before Jimmy Johnson. I think he was the coach right before Jimmy Johnson. Um, but, but my point is this: um, it's you had three different head coaches during that reign of terror, and then I mean even even the last one in two thousand one, which was considered by many to be the pinnacle Miami team, and and it is in the argument for being maybe the greatest college football team of all time. Larry Coker was a first year head coach, and still managed to win a title with that team. Now, granted, I I. I actually give. Um, Dennis was after. Dennis was after. Okay, I'm fine with being wrong, man. I don't have it in front of no, my face. But it's the era, though. Like, yes, they but, were coaching in the same era. Like would, Jimmy Johnson left to go coach the pros. Dennis Erickson just happened to. It was. Slide up. But with Larry Coker, so it's interesting because Larry Coker, I don't consider to be a great head coach. I actually think he's very mediocre. No, he but he inherited he inherited ball, Butch Davis's teams from those yes. late '90s that were always one game away. And by the way, 
uh, in, I think it was 2000 or 1999, one of those years they beat Florida State and ended up getting passed over for the national championship by Florida State. I think it was 1999, um, or it might have been 2000. There was a year they went 11-1, and and they beat FSU, and still FSU got picked to go to the title game over them, which is just insane to me. I think it was 2000, actually. I think it was 2000, they went 11-1, and beat FSU, yet FSU got to play Oklahoma in the title game that year instead. And you just wonder, does Bob Stoops get his championship if that Florida team gets a chance to play Oklahoma? And does Miami now have six titles instead of, of, of five? That was actually covered in the U as well. That was a point of controversy, too, that they got robbed of a championship game appearance. And beating not only your rival, but a highly ranked rival, which would have propelled you to the national championship game that you ultimately deserve to play in. You did everything that you could to play in that game. Who was but, Miami's loss to that year? There was some reason why they ranked FSU ahead of them, despite the fact that they both were 10-1 and one at that point, yet Miami had the head-to-head win. That's what doesn't make sense to me. And I know we're going off on a tangent, but we're also done with our with our discussion really on this. So I feel like I can I can take a little bit of a of a detour here. I want to look at the the 2000 Big East standings because this was back when they were both in the Big East, right? Or was this the ACC still? So Miami was in the Big East. Florida State was already in ACC. Okay, so they were in different conferences at that point. But but um, that made no sense to me though. Because, like, again, I wasn't watching football back then, but to, to hear that about how Miami beat FSU, did, that, but despite that, still ended up behind them in the BCS rankings, um, made no sense to me. Let me see real quick, because I want to get that schedule up. Uh, maybe said F- 2000, correct? Yeah, 2000. Um, cause 2000, the title game was, uh, FSU versus Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, they lost to, uh, Washington by five points, but they beat, Washington. they beat Florida state who was the number one team in the country at that point by three. Now granted they did it at home, but I don't think that should take away from it. Florida state on the other hand, their one loss that year was to, and I'm pulling it up right now because I... I'm unfortunately not a complete textbook on this. Uh, their one loss was, yeah, to Miami by, by three, but their big win that year out of uh, before the championship game, their best win was against Florida. Um, now granted, you know, it's a, it's a big win. They, they, they beat the crap out of Florida. They beat them 30-7. to seven. But I, I just don't think that that was worthy enough of putting them ahead of Miami. I, I get it. Miami was coming off of a win against um, against uh, Boston College, fifty-two to six. But like, even then, th- that's that's one of the big head scratchers. Virginia, two, uh, Virginia Tech was the number two team in the country, and they beat them by twenty. Why did Miami not play for the championship in two thousand? I, okay, that is going to haunt me now. Why the hell did Miami not play for the championship in 2000? That might be maybe one of the biggest head scratchers in the history of, of college football. And it's why the BCS didn't work also. Because how the hell do you have Florida State ahead of Miami in 2000? Just like in 2003, how do you have how do you have USC not playing for the championship that year? I get it. You had Oklahoma and you had LSU, but like... I, I just... I don't see how USC wasn't at least better than one of those programs. Well, we can't dwell on it now. No. It's happened already. And then there was the mess that no, was 2004. Gonna be a, I understand, but at the end of the day, there isn't much else we can do. It's it's done. What's done is done. Awards have been handed out. I can't believe I'm saying this, but justice for Miami. You can you can complain and bitch all you want about the 2002 uh, season and the 2003 title game against OSU, which, by the way, that was pass interference, and you all need to accept it. Um, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, justice for Miami in 2000, the reason probably why Butch, Butch Davis left, because he probably thought to himself, well, that's it. If I can't get into a title game despite that, I don't know what to tell you all. 
Larry Coker comes in and pick up, picks up the scraps. And I say that because... He, he won with what, the residuals. I mean, he contended... He, he got back to the title game in 2003. Or, or rather, for the 02-03 season. Then finished, I think, top five again the very next year. But after year three, that team fell off a cliff. And it's because he couldn't recruit like Butch Davis did. He couldn't sustain like Butch Davis did. And I think you saw Larry Coker was just one of the best cases of right place, right time. And then got in over his head. Yeah. One could argue he was in over his head anyway. I, I, I have a strong theory that you could have put Lane Kiffin on that 2001 team and they would have won the championship. That that was just such a loaded roster. Lane Kiffin... And on that the- note... <laughs> We are going to conclude this episode. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. How how podcast. dare I insult Larry Coker? He's clearly a better head coach than Lane Kiffin. I think Lane Kiffin is also going to be a new designation for ending something. You're right. Because <laughs> I was the not Lane train to has parked itself in the station, <laughs> and with that, we're good. We're ta- okay, before we conclude, we're talking about a man who got relieved of his job on the team charter bus. No, 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 no. He got relieved of his job on the freaking team tarmac. It was at an airport. The tarmac. Dang. You're right. They had, they literally had, had, I think it was they had just deboarded the plane, and they were like, all right, Lane. That's what he, it was. Uh, you're was gone. <laughs> okay. He took not two steps off the plane. They were like, all right. See you, bud. Come here. We need to talk to you real quick. Just come, just come, just come this way. It's, yeah, it's, see this? You see this? Shh. Shh. I, I mean, McKay still hasn't lived down that hire. They hired him because they liked his personality. That's it. That was a personality hire. I mean, you saw what he did at... I wouldn't have trusted the man after what he did at Tennessee. Why the hell would you give him that job? Well... He's at Ole Miss now. Yes, he is. And, God, you want to talk about a a rehabilitation of an image. Lane Kiffin embracing who he is is the best decision he ever made in terms of image. Stop trying to be the goody two-shoes that sucks up for the players, that tries to play nice to the media. Embrace the fact that you are Joey Freshwater. That is who you are. That is your brand. Your brand is, is pomp and circumstance and a little bit of sleaziness. That's you. Embrace it. You get to do it in Mississippi now for a better place. Yeah, and if you win eight games, it's considered a success. My God, Ole Miss has fallen, too. Oh. Well, we don't have to go any further than that. We're fine. No, I'm going to stop calling out. This is turning into SEC shorts where Saturday's down south, and that was not the intent of this. That's Big Ten, folk. I speak for all of us when I say this. I'm a little dirty. I feel a little dirty. But but what are the three greatest letters in the history of this country? S E C S E C S E C. It's not USA. No man, it's S E C. Oh. I mean, no conference matters. You got sixteen teams, and really only six of them worth a damn. Uh, you can make an argument it's even less than that, but. I, I, I just refuse to believe that there's a universe where football exists outside of that corner of the country. Clemson's I, but everybody else just, nah. Yeah, I'm, we can tolerate a Clemson. I, everybody else. They're an honorary member of the SEC. Honorary. They are. I really want the SEC to annex Clemson and just trade out um, South Carolina. I know that will never happen, <laughs> but... If they did, then we'd see a hell of a lot less of both Give them of those the teams. Notre Dame. You can schedule five of our teams, but we're definitely getting rid of Clemson. No, I mean, if you if you get rid of Clemson, it's a win-win for both conferences because someone else will actually win the damn thing for once in the ACC. And then on top of that, the SEC gets to add another power, and Alabama gets to suffer with having to play them every single year, or at the very least every other year, because they'll probably be in the East. The trade, no, the trade I actually seriously want to happen, which won't happen, is I really want South Carolina to be traded to the um, ACC for um, for Florida State. Because I want Florida State-Florida to be an in-state rivalry, personally, in conference, but... 
And Florida State can actually hold its own in recruiting in the SEC, which is why I think that that would make sense. And if anything, it actually helps South Carolina because they're not competing against SEC schools for recruiting, and their level of play would match up more with the level of play in the ACC right now. I think it's a win-win for both schools personally, but I know it's not going to happen because that's not a fair trade at all. It's not fair, although the end complications make sense. But you solve two in-state rivalries and make them both conference ones. But it is what it is. On that note, this has been a very long very, very long. Probably the second longest episode we've done. Um, episode 8. <sighs> Follow us on Twitter at I am Finkelstein at NixTape15. Uh, be sure to hit the like button. Subscribe to our channel. We we would really appreciate it. Um, I, I think at some point I really do have to f- figure out how this audio editing thing works. It's just laziness on my part. I, I even took that part out of our video descriptions because I'm just not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. It'll happen at some point. Our content is good. Please listen to us. Anyway, I think I think that's a stopping point, man. I think that's it. <laughs> this was great. Tune in again. Our next segment of the part two of this series, Blue Bloods and College Basketball. Maybe shorter, maybe longer. Who knows? Stay I, tuned. It would be very difficult to top this. Um, but if it, if it ends up being that long, so be it. Um, but I expect that to be a little bit more Nick heavy than, than me. And that's fine. I could listen to you talk sports all day. That's why I picked you as my broadcast partner. I'm touched. Team trash boat for life, man. Team trash boat. All right, guys. (laughs) Thank you for listening. We will see you back in, uh, two weeks. See ya. All right. See ya.